Before the success stories, the progress, there was you. You who made a choice to grow, to inspire, to overcome your own challenges. At NASM, we're in service of your limitless potential because when you keep growing, we all get stronger and we'll never stop making your journey our mission. Join the fitness leader. Become a fitness leader. Become a certified personal trainer. You're listening to the NASM CPT Podcast with Rick Ritchie, winner of the Share Care Emmy Award for Social Storytelling and the official podcast of the National Academy of Sports Medicine. Hey, y'all, and welcome to the NASM CPT Podcast. My name is Rick Ritchie, and today I'm going to have a guest on with us that's going to help us a little bit with business and i know like you know we go back and forth we'll talk a little bit about business we'll talk about training we'll talk about programming we'll add in science we'll talk about pet peeves right and this is a podcast that's designed to help personal trainers in all aspects of being a cpt but where we don't get a lot of help where we don't really get the alley oops is when somebody is there to help us Try to identify better means of creating systems, not like the OPT model when it comes to programming, which is a great system that's in place, but more about systems when it comes to your business. What are some of the basic things that we can include and have in our business systems? What can we include when it comes to helping identify the right tech for you as a trainer, but also the user experience for for people that you work with? What is uh, a way to get paid? What are some of these things that come up with us? So these are topics that I uh, was having conversations with our guest about, and therefore he is a guest on the podcast because it's going to work out really well. It's interesting to me, and I think you are going to find it quite interesting. So my guest today is the owner of a company called Superset, and he's here to talk about to us about the business of personal training. Welcome, Taylor Pemberton. What's going on, Taylor? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's going well. Thanks for the yeah, intro. Man. Yeah, well, I'm super excited that that we connected not too long ago. I believe it was at Strong New York. Yeah. And um, uh, it, was a, it was a great event. It was an opportunity for fitness folk to get together and chat. And then that's where you and I had reconnected yep. and uh, it started getting the ball rolling <laughs> on this process. So one of the things that you mentioned when, when we were talking about getting you on the podcast was something about business systems. So first of all, what does that even mean? And why is that something that we may want to consider? Yeah. I mean, so it's really interesting. I, I went through the NASM program myself, and obviously you mentioned there's a bunch of systems related to how do you excel as a coach and how do you implement things within programming and within just the kind of success journey of onboarding a client and bringing them through various portions of their training modalities. Mm. I think uh, on the business side, that's this entirely other category. Like it's um, how do you think, you know, smart about what do you invest in? What tools do you use to set up the foundation of your business? How do you um, create touch points for your customers at one to five clients, five to 10 clients and beyond? And obviously this changes a lot, whether you're working within a bigger box gym or kind of a chain national gym or your private gym owner yourself, or maybe you just work independently and you're at that stage of your career. So the systems can kind of change depending on what you're trying to accomplish. But um, we hear this all the time when we work with coaches. They're always talking about how their systems oriented. And uh, there has been a lot of good kind of Q and A and ways that we've helped people throughout the years. Um, and I'm happy to share kind of more of why we see such importance around developing good systems in your business. Well, I think the this is one of the things I talk about with my business partners, uh, regardless of what business it is and things that I try to implement as a fitness professional is identifying what the systems are and what they're designed to do and why they make sense. So as a business owner, there are systems that I have and it's a system around what's my marketing plan 
And that system is very important because it allows me to go after clients, whether that's personal training clients or in the, the gym world, getting people into the gym. Right. So there's a system there. It's, it, you know, the, the last thing you want to do is just kind of create a scattershot of, I think this is a good idea and that's a good idea. And you may have a lot of good ideas, but usually unless you put it together in a system, then you don't know which ideas were the ones that hit. Mm-hmm. So putting together a system is important. Why, how would that be implemented and not, not necessarily for you as a business owner, but for individuals as personal trainers, what kind of systems are you can get potentially looking at that yeah. makes that make sense for the individual trainer? Yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting. People use the terms I'm designing the system. And so my background's in design. So I'm a, a designer by trade uh, before Superset, I worked as a product designer in bigger tech companies like Airbnb, Google, and then my last hurrah was sort of Spotify on the creator studio team. And like a lot of what we did there was- I've heard of those businesses, by the way. Sorry? Those are all legit businesses. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and obviously they're they're succeeding at such a scale that, you know, there's kind of a ruthless mentality of how do you um, bring user experience to the forefront of Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's the artist, the label, who's trying to- increase their impact or their reach on the Spotify platform or how listeners actually consume that content and experience Mm. in artists work. So if we bring that over to personal training, it's, I think a lot in terms of user experience, it's like, how do I want my customer to experience every single part of what I'm doing with them? And like I said, that's going to differ from one to five to 10 clients and beyond, but um, it's almost this like operating mentality of do I want to leave the user or in this case, the client with a positive impact every single time that I, you know, reach them? Or is it something that they have to kind of like figure out on their own? Are they getting frustrated? Is it inconsistent? Um, you mentioned your market marketing uh, systems within your business. Mm-hmm. I think that's a great example because it's like, how does everything kind of cohesively fit together and feel like it's part of the same identity? Um, even comes down to how do you write copy and how do you like, communicate with your customers and how reliable or trustworthy do you come across to customers? So these are all kind of the emotional, soulful sides of systems. And then there's the actual like logistics and uh, I'd say like the utilitarian based side of systems. So it's like, what tools do you invest in? Is it a tool where you can kind of do a bunch of different stuff with that one tool and therefore the user doesn't have to figure everything out for the first time, every single time they interact with you? Or are you kind of hodgepodging and duct taping stuff together? And so then that means you need to invest in different tools. You need to figure them out on your own, which means you're probably going to be doing a worse job when it comes to delivering that value to the customer. And then the customer also has to open those up, sometimes create accounts for each one of those, and then figure out like the familiarities around how to use a product. And that's that's kind of just like the, the basis for user experience. We talk a lot in design about removing friction for the user. Mm-hmm. And so I've always really felt like you know, I, I played sports in college and then fell in love with the gym through that lens. But I empathize so much with all of these people that are going after their health journey for the first time. And they are really trying to like put their best foot forward. And so it's already hard enough to like wake up, motivate yourself. Even if you have a coach, it's hard to like be like, all right, I'm going to go to the gym today. I'm going to be consistent this time around. I'm going to put on these clothes. I'm going to go to the gym. And if there's stuff getting in your way where it's like, how do I access my programming or how do I like make sure that my coach knows that I'm late? Like there's just all this stuff that can interfere with you actually going through and succeeding in that journey. I think that's a lot of what I care about is just removing um, as much as possible the like technological friction with a user um, because they already have so much that they're trying to figure out and succeed with on their own. Yeah, it was so, or so I know that some of those friction points are payments and you had mentioned something about considering as a coach, considering charging clients every 28 days, which sounds like a very specifically random number. To yes. Me. It's like almost a month, but mm, it's not. Yeah. Uh, but, but why would that be the case? Are, are you talking yeah. about, um, like a membership for personal training, or are you just saying I'm invoicing them before or after a training? Like, what are your thoughts on that? Sure. What, did, what did you come with? Yeah. So we actually learned about this through a coach that was using Superset to run their business. And 
they were like, hey, I see that I can set up a monthly recurring payment offer with my client, but can I do 28 days? And we were like, why would you want to do 28 days? And he's like, well, it lets me actually capture one full extra month every calendar year. So instead of capturing 12 months of revenue, I can capture 13 months. And the reason is because a lot of months obviously have 30 or 31 days, except for February. So if you do the math, the simplest way to look at it, this is if you take 365 days in a year and divide that by 28, it comes up to 13.04 billing cycles. So it essentially allows the coach to charge on these four week increments, which, you know, for all intents and purposes is a month. And then that maximizes the revenue that you're earning as a coach um, on the other side. And like, I don't think there's anything to be weary about there because um, you are training in these like four week blocks. And so that's kind of one way to just maximize and, you know, get a little bit more out of um, your business that you wouldn't have otherwise done before. And it's something that's completely passive too. Like, it's not like you have to check in on it or do some sort of um, manual work around each time. It's just the the system knows that every four weeks it's going to kind of reset. I like that. I think that's fair. I mean, considering there's, um, you know, I, I believe the average is 4.2 or 4.3 weeks in every month. So yep. just go, just go with four weeks. And then that gets you an extra block of four weeks yeah. of payment out of that. And, exactly. And, and if you're, cycle. that's actually really smart. And if you're training um, clients in, in the block format, which I know is pretty common, you know, it might be that every eight weeks you have a new training block that gets introduced. So I think it actually really conveniently lines up with the psychology within this industry in particular, whereas like other industries, they might be like, Hey, this is kind of random. Like, why is it every 28 days? And it, at least in this case, you can explain to people that this is based on like when you're refreshing the different blocks. Um, and you also asked about, is this someone that's doing this monthly? I mean, I think it just depends. Um, obviously, like I said, there's many different ways to succeed in training clients. You might be an online only coach who's doing four week blocks and it's completely asynchronous. You might be an in-person trainer who is just kind of bundling the in-person sessions into those four week blocks. So it scales pretty well between whether you're online, in-person or hybrid, in my opinion. Ooh, I do. I do like this. This is actually a, a pretty smart thing. Now, sometimes there are people, um, and, and I don't do this, but I oftentimes travel, so I, I'm having a hard time figuring out how I would implement it. But there are a lot of trainers that are like, hey, these are the, you know, I'm here. So if you want to train with me, you sign up for these six four week blocks, right? Or four, four week blocks. And then you just pay either monthly or every four weeks, or you buy the system and that's what you pay for and you pay up front. Mm -hmm. And so there's a certain amount of training sessions every week that goes into that. So maybe it's two training sessions a week, maybe it's three training sessions a week. Um, but people are signing up for really the block of things, not signing up to do individual sessions that they pay uh, whenever they pay, right? So yeah. I think that's a pretty cool concept to add in if you were sure. doing the 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 system in those blocks. It's yeah. pretty smart. Yeah, and the reality of you know being in your first couple of years of either being an independent personal trainer or just learning the ropes in a gym is you kind of have to be scrappy. Like you have to iterate and experiment and figure out what is your value? How are you different? And how do you package that up and sell that to the individual in the way that feels best at that point in time? So you alluded to this could cover, you know, three training sessions and something else that goes into the overall package. For instance, like we see a lot of these kind of new era coaches who are offering like mindset coaching sessions, or in some case meal plans and, um, sort of, uh, like, uh, macro, you know, not like in-depth dietitian type stuff, but just general overview, like fitness, nutrition, mindset. And um, I think it's really cool that you can kind of like pepper in different pieces of that value, depending on um, what price you think that's ultimately worth. And then it's kind of up to the market to decide and you can iterate as you, as you move forward. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I like that. You also mentioned digital wallets. Um, and when it comes to how payments are being done. So yeah, sometimes people walk in with cash. It's not a lot anymore. Um, I used to get a lot, do you accept credit cards? But now I feel like I don't get that very much anymore. It's just kind of like, what, what do you use in order to receive payment? So 
is that um, is that here to stay? Is there another type of payment system that you're going to look at? What are some of the options there when it comes to digital wallets? Totally. So we use a payment infrastructure called Stripe, which a lot of the listeners will be familiar with if they've ever used an online coaching platform and have set up their business that way. Um, the main concept here to think about again is just going back to a frictionless user experience. So being able to pay with Apple Pay or Google Pay has become so commonplace now that there's two formats that I kind of see being really applicable here. One is if you're walking into a physical gym, you can have a card reader where you just pay via Apple Pay like you would at the convenience store. And then the other is where you are sent an invite link to create an account for a coach, whether it's a hybrid or an online coach, and they're onboarding you into their system or their CRM. And in that case, you press you know, pay now and it actually just brings up the little widget on your phone, whether you have Android or, or iOS, and you just pay that way. And the main thing that I think is really important here is we see um, at least like a 40% uptick in conversion rate for people that use one-click payments. I mean, I just personally relate to this a lot because like I've been on the treadmill doing an incline walk for 20 minutes and you know there's something cool on eBay that I want to buy and I didn't bring my wallet with me and I don't want to bring out my card and have to like take a photo of the card or worse enter the details themselves right. and so I can just kind of pay through Apple Pay and there's a lot of different situations like this that occur um, and I think that is the main thing to be thinking about is how to just make this as frictionless as possible for the end user um, and in this case, the technology already exists. A lot of people have this stuff already set up on their devices. So why not invest and just kind of be a modern version of uh, this coach in this format? And then I think on the other side is kind of the Wild West approach, which a lot of people are still going after, which is cash, Venmo, PayPal. And those are certainly ways that you can accept payments in the early days. But come tax season, it's a little bit hard to wrangle all your different revenue. Maybe you're not even reporting certain revenue. So there's obviously like everyone has their own choice. But what I like to tell people is if you're thinking really big about being successful in business, you know, you don't want to just continue doing non-scalable methods. You want to eventually start to invest in stuff. And if it means that you're making, you know, over six figures, but you're paying taxes properly versus making 40K a year or 30K a year and you're taking cash or Venmo and you have to kind of scrape those things together and then maybe you get hit in the future with a penalty it's just not worth it so it's cool to think about like where are you in your business how can you set up these systems to set you up for success i also want to point out to to those people who are like i'm trying not to to show all the money i'm making yeah. so i'm making some money and i've got some money on the side um cool whatever except um when you decide that you want to open your own business and you cannot prove income, and I speak to this as somebody who has had to prove income, you got you got no track record. So maybe you made sixty or seventy thousand dollars, but thirty of that was in cash. And so you're only showing thirty or forty thousand dollars that you're paying taxes yeah, on. Great point. Which also means that your lenders will only be seeing thirty or forty thousand dollars. Yep. And so if you're trying to open a business, then that's not going to go very well. But let's move into not even what opening a business. Let's also talk about uh whether you want to get an apartment yep. or get a mortgage. Yep. So yep. now we're really talking about like you may not be in the in the uh, out there trying to open your own training business or open your own gym or whatever it is. And I I love when people have that entrepreneurial spirit and they want to do that. But when you're not showing income, most people will look forward to having their own place one day, whether or not that's a business place like living and having your own mortgage. It's going to be really hard to do if you don't have proof of income. Yeah, absolutely. So these type of payments that you're talking about, yeah. Taylor, are spot on. And I yeah. just want to say, like, having Taylor here. So Taylor Pemberton is the guest today. My name is Rick Richards, the NASM CPT podcast. Having him on today and talking about some of this stuff, I think, is really important for us as personal trainers to try to identify what it is we're doing. Now, I know some of you are like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Cash is king. I'm totally into that. And, and I get where you're coming from. But I want to also say that back in the day when I opened my my first gym and people were like, hey, can I just buy sessions with cash? And I'd be like, okay, so how can I buy it with cash? And then how can I put it in the system where it 
it shows like it's not actually paid for that maybe there's a gift and so now i'm only so i can have the cash and not and i'm trying to come up with ways and then after a while uh, it was probably a year or two it was like everything has to be shown every expense you you stay tight with your expenses you show every expense so you can do your write-offs and you also show every single penny you make so that I can expand the business. And I can't expand the business if I'm there trying to cheat myself out of my profits to show that I'm making money. So anyway, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I hope yeah. that that makes sense for everybody because Taylor, I know it makes sense to, to Yeah, you. and I'm, I'm certainly not um, anti-cash at all. Um, the, the Tony Soprano approach can totally work. And you, you can have certain clients who still pay cash and that's totally fine. It's more just like, when it comes time to provide a refund to somebody because there's a dispute, you know, you have record of these things happening um, in a digital sense, in a receipt sense. Uh, depending on the technology that you use, you can easily offer a refund, whereas like you have to go get cash or maybe you have to like, maybe you've spent certain parts of that cash. Um, and then like what you were mentioning with deductions, like so much of being a business owner and having, you know, sort of grade A systems is being able to deduct expenses and have things logged in QuickBooks or whatever other software that you use. And then, yeah, just to kind of piggyback on the rent and mortgage piece, um, I've had to deal with this before because I've uh, been a 1099 employee where I've earned significant income and lenders just don't care about that as much as they care about, you know, other forms of income. And so it's good to just reinforce as much of this security as you can um, if you're, you know, planning to progress through life and just keep building upon all the success that you're trying to make. Perfect. Yeah, thank you for, for adding that in. All right, so now I want to talk to you. I know this is uh, what Superset is, so which is the company that, that Taylor owns and runs. But here's, here's a statement, and I'm curious because it says, why spreadsheets are still the programming tool of choice for trainers and coaches? And my question is, are they? So I'll let you then uh, take that question on. Yeah. So we talk to coaches every single day and we have brand new coaches coming into our funnel. Our funnel is our marketing funnel. So they're finding out. We're going to talk about Superset. that too. We will. Yeah. They're, they're finding out about, out about Superset for the first time and we're having first interactions with them and sort of demoing what our product, you know, provides and the value and whatnot. So um, again, coming from a product design background, this is like a topic that I took really seriously and the entire team cared a lot about. And we're familiar with all the other platforms that exist. Um, everyone's kind of done their own different spin on how to create programs in a digital interface. And like what I personally thought ended up happening is there ended up becoming this kind of feature swamp where everyone was trying to do something slightly different. So if you wanted to switch platforms, you kind of had to learn this different tool. Um, and eventually, like, especially with COVID, it, it resulted in this thing called like app fatigue is what I would call it, where it's just like, oh, I have to learn like another app. It's just like another thing that I have to learn. Yeah. And one of the biggest things that we found was like coaches and personal trainers just kept going back to using Excel and Google Sheets. Like they just loved using spreadsheets. Um, I think the viewers or the listeners can probably ascertain why it's like easy to use on a keyboard. It's familiar. You've used it for other parts um, or other workflows in your life. Uh, there's shortcuts. There's the ability to drag and sort of populate cells, do formulas, et cetera. So we were like, okay, this is kind of a novel challenge because the spreadsheet is obviously loved by coaches and trainers. But when you deliver an Excel file or a Google sheet link to a client, they're trying to open that up on their phone and they're like pinching and zooming to try to like tap into an mm -hmm. exercise and they're trying to enter data and the Google Sheets experience on a mobile device is pretty bad. So uh, especially editing, not even just like viewing. So that was something that we were like, okay, there's obviously like this decade old problem. Coaches and trainers love spreadsheets, but the end result that gets generated is is not up to standards of today. So that's really where we injected our values. We, we kind of created this like spreadsheet to fitness app generator where whatever you put in feels super familiar on the, the coach side. And then you press assign and save and it gets applied to the client's account and it looks and feels like a best in class fitness app where you just scroll down you can you know interact really gesturally within the product or within the the device um, so it just feels super native on both sides which again going back to user experience you don't really need to introduce these like new patterns or new behaviors you just kind of build upon things that people already love and and know so i think that's like a smart approach to solving some of these problems 
Speaking of solving some of the problems, this is kind of a, a fun question that was later down on the list when, when you and I were, were interacting. There are some problems that can be solved with AI. And the, the chat GPT-4, I believe, just came out and its updates seem to be pretty spectacular. So, like, are we artificially intelligencing <laughs> ourselves out of jobs here? Yeah. No, I, great question. I Everyone's going to have a different viewpoint on this. I think it's just an accelerant to doing better work if you choose to embrace it and you choose to learn. And again, it's like part of being a business owner is you have to be like, there's things here that I'm not so good at. And you can either hire people, you can use tools to help achieve those um, different solutions that you're trying to figure out. Uh, in this case, I think it was cool. Like um, OpenAI had like one of the default prompts was like, generate me a workout program or something. So I think if you have a scarcity mindset in this industry, there's all sorts of ways that you can feel anxious or feel worried. Um, I think really it's a long-term bet that the way that people succeed is by having a coach by their side. It's like the one-to-one -one accountability layer that really is important here. And then there's obviously all the in-person technique and like form correction stuff that is really hard to accomplish digitally. But I think there's just really clever ways to kind of increase your output. So it's like, um, how do you synthesize information or how do you like yeah, figure out best in class ways to interact with your customers um, through using like tools that aren't gonna make you sound like a robot, but you can kind of use it to complement some of your existing ways of doing things. So there's always going to be people out there who get started with whatever's the lowest barrier to entry. And I think this is a net positive for the industry because I mean, I got started through like playing sports growing up, but I also got started by finding training programs on like T Nation and internet forums and oldbodybuilding.com forum. Um, shout out the miscellaneous uh, section. Um, the like ways that I got into it weren't necessarily correct for me at the time, but it just allowed me enough help to kind of get past that on-ramp where I really fell in love with it. And then I started to kind of compound over time and kind of shift gears as I developed as a person. So I personally think that anything that gets people from going from zero exercise or zero effort into, you know, one version of effort is good because there's a certain percentage of those people that will churn and will fall off, but there's also a certain percentage that will download an AI fitness app or uh, do an AI fitness app for like three to six months. And they're like, oh, I'm not making any progress. There's this trainer that I saw that I really like. Maybe I'll hit them up and see if they're like taking on new clients. And so it just creates like all, it all funnels towards, I think the success of people getting healthier, which was, which is overall a good thing. Yeah, I think you're right because there was never, um, I don't think we've ever really been at a loss for having access to workouts. I mean, you could, you could get, um, a, a women's point. health magazine or shape or T nation or bodybuilding.com. And all of these things have workouts. It's, and, and let's say AI says, doo -doo 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 -doo, here's an even better workout and this is a better workout for you and your height and your fitness level and it's giving you great workouts so many times it's not whether or not there is a workout present it is whether or not there is someone present to encourage me to do the workout to be accountable to do the workout to make me feel safer while i'm doing the workout yeah. so I, I feel like I'm I'm with you on that. That we're not we're we're not ever at a, a shortage of cool and good and conceivably functional working programs that could create benefit in any and every type of body and every person. It's just whether or not somebody is there to support you in the process. Yes, not yeah, not it, the the exercises themselves. Yeah, and it'll force it'll force the supply side of the market to get even better at their craft and figure out ways to adapt mm -hmm. and essentially be that accountability pillar in these people's lives in better ways. So yeah, I totally agree with what you're saying. There's always been workout programs. You can find a six or eight week workout program by just Googling a term and that's not going to make you successful or make necessarily mean that you're going to finish and achieve your goals. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So we, we kind of gone through and we talked about payment, receiving payment. But you had mentioned at some point, not in this podcast, like we've we talked before this, everybody. So don't think that that I'm like bringing this up and you're like, he didn't say that at all. We, we talked before this and you mentioned about uh, the possibility 
for trainers to accept HSA and FSA funds. Now, I've never done that. I didn't even know that was a thing. So is that is that true? Is this a real story? Or are you just saying, yeah. hey, now I'm throwing out some cool ideas. Get me yeah. on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, it's just uh, my Trojan horse into this whole I knew situation. It. I knew it. Um, yeah, I, so it's it's very early in this development. It's it's essentially just happened in the last like three to six months. But there are certain companies out there that allow people to use HSA or FS, FSA, HSA's health savings account, um, which companies can offer essentially the ability to use like pre-tax dollars on health related expenses. So it's just mentally an easier way for clients to separate, okay, I'm going to use this money for investing in a trainer or investing in a gym membership. And so that is essentially what has been happening. And I mentioned we use Stripe for, for our payment infrastructure, which keeps everything super automated and very easy to use for the coach side and the client side. And so this will eventually become an integration where you can just offer it as a payment method, which if you kind of take a step back and you think about, okay, how am I reaching these different people? How am I making it easy for them to sign up with me? This is just another offering that you can position and make it so that people can choose to use HSA or FSA accounts to pay for coaching. Now, how would that be used? So even, even in the setup, if, if somebody, if I have a client, I'm using your platform and the client says, Hey, I have uh, this HSA and they allow for gym and fitness things. And they told me I can use this and you go, yes, you can. But also you're like, I don't know what that means. I mean, I don't know how to go about doing that. Like what yeah. is the process of, I mean, that's not, here's a MasterCard Visa American Express. That's, yeah. It's a different system. Yeah. Essentially it's just a quick kind of white glove onboarding on our side where we would speak with you directly and get it plugged into your account. And then when you go to create a payment offer and offer that to the client, instead of it surfacing the kind of normal payment portal, it would just position the HSA and FSA instructions instead and allow you to just kind of link whatever needs linking at that point in time. So it's definitely not anything crazy. It's it's just okay. the there are companies recently that have popped up that kind of service this middle layer that make this possible. And we were one of the first people to see the importance of this and kind of integrate it into our tooling. That's really cool. Yeah, that is really cool. Um, all right. So ladies and gentlemen, this is Taylor Pemberton, and uh, he has decided to help us out on the NASM CPT podcast when it comes to business and talking about business and some of the, the benefits of programming and implementing systems, payments, such as uh, using Stripe and using systems to help pay, setting up payments every 28 days instead of monthly. So you get another billing cycle in there using HSAs and uh, FSAs to to potentially fund some of the personal training. But he did say something earlier in this conversation that I said we would get back to. And he was talking about sales funnels or marketing funnels. And to be honest, for the longest time, I would I would hear people say, oh, what are your sales funnels? And what are your marketing funnels? And funnels, and these are funnels. And boy, this is funnel. So I don't, I don't even know, like, what does that mean for a personal trainer? What is a sales funnel? And what does that mean for a fitness professional as they're trying to, to build their business and find new people? Yeah. Yeah. And funnel to me has always been this like overcomplicated thing. So I'll try to break it down into the simplest format. Nice. So, um, First off, like I think to be a successful personal trainer or coach, you have to be a good salesperson. It's just a necessary evil. And I see this on Reddit all the time where people are like, oh, I have worked at Crunch for six months, but really it's a sales role and therefore I hate working here and I don't want to be doing this. So I think everyone goes through this process where it's like, oh, uh, I discover the actual like work involved with, you know, becoming successful and making this passion of mine into an actual business. Mm -hmm. So. The more you can embrace it, the more you can learn about it and twist it into something that feels good for you is always going to be the best route. As far as how a funnel is set up, the, the easiest way to think about it is just three sections. So you have the top, the middle, and the bottom of the funnel. So the top, and I, I'll come up with a, here's a uh, use case that people relate to if they work at a gym or know how gyms work. So the top of the funnel is just getting people to walk into the gym in the first place. That could be 
ads that you see out there in the wild. It could be the street appeal. Maybe you walk by it and you look inside and you're like, whoa, this gym looks really cool. I've been thinking about joining one recently. The other is like word of mouth. You have friends that go there. So you know about this place. Step one is the top of the funnel, actually getting the person to come into the gym. The next is the middle of the funnel, which is qualifying prospects or customers into um, what I would either call like customers for the first time or kind of super customers, people that build deeper affinity within that business. So in the gym example, I would say a really good qualifier is just getting someone to sign up for a gym membership because mm -hmm. the way that those brick and mortar businesses work obviously is the membership is the first step and then you might eventually invest in training. So um, that's kind of like one simple way to look at it. And then the bottom of the funnel is just how do you close that person into a customer? And in that case, in this example, I would say, how do you convert them into working with a trainer? Um, and how do you as a trainer kind of convert them to a one-to-one -one relationship uh, to get dedicated support or provide that dedicated support? So those are the simple three sections. It's interesting. Like I know I have a whiteboard behind me with a bunch of drawings on it. We've drawn this out mm -hmm. a bunch where um, we spoke in the very, very beginning of this episode about systems that coaches know on how to make a client successful through these different like training modalities. And the way that I've always envisioned it is the sales and marketing funnel is before this person has started with you. It's like before day one. So the, the triangle is essentially coming down to a point to where the conversion happens. And then really what happens is the triangle flips upside down and you're growing and you're blossoming this client throughout the relationship that you work with them. Mm -hmm. So they do very much interrelate. It's essentially like these two triangles uh, stacked on top of each other. Um, the top one's upside down, but it's essentially just how do you funnel people into this conversion point and how do you make it about um, things that they care about. How do you know uh, what niche you're going to be most successful in if that's something that you um, are working on? And then like, how do you, you know, use systems in your business to obviously be more successful at different parts of those um, funnel mechanisms? So like the top of the funnel, how can I, you know, quote, automagically collect leads? How can I then qualify leads? Because I don't want to hop on a sales call or like spend a bunch of time with people that are super unqualified. And then how do I have just like a one click payment link or an onboarding um, system to where I can convert that person into a customer and then the real fun begins. So that's, that's kind of the simplest way that we've thought about a funnel. So if I, if I see this, um, it makes sense doing that for things like, uh, like you're working for a corporate gym, right? So this is the walk by the curbside appeal. This is the, the the billboards that are out there that gets people to come in and then you kind of do an intro session and that is a way to kind of differentiate who's interested and who is you know qualifying right and then we we build that down and you and you describe it kind of like that funnel is an hourglass right so it's not just a triangle exactly. down but then it blossoms back out um, for an independent trainer, so for independent because so much of the the initial parts of the funnels are for a corporate gym are the corporations who are setting it up. So how do we as independent trainers or those that are listening that are independent trainers or just want to build a little side hustle outside of the corporate gym, what are some ways that they might initiate that first step in the marketing and and then start to 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 clarify who is is more likely to be able to work for them? Yeah. Yeah, great question. So I think this is something that's been belabored at this point, but it's like, do I have to create TikTok dances and Instagram reels in order yes. to be yeah. my <laughs> trainer? Like that's, nobody wants to do that. Some people are just really naturally <laughs> geared toward that. Depending on your background and what you're comfortable with, you can obviously kill it doing that format. But uh, going back to like the kind of gym example or branching out independently, I think, again, just building really good relationships. It's like remembering people's birthdays and like, getting more um, interested in their personal lives and getting word of mouth referrals. And I think like what happens with those coaches and trainers is eventually one of those people moves across the country or like they change jobs and there's just all these different things or like the coach changes what gym they work at or they maybe go work at a private gym instead of a big box gym or they want to uh, put a bunch of equipment in their garage and roll up the doors and have people stop by their house. So right. it's building the relationships. It's having an abundance mindset where like, this is not something that I need to be hard selling people on right now, but eventually this is going to blossom and I'm making a name for myself and this is going to lead to, to better and better business over time. And then obviously like the online method is there's either organic 
or paid acquisition. And uh, yeah. there's a lot to unpack in both of those different camps, but uh, both can be successful formats, depending on how much you know about that, what your budget is, um, like how, how long you've been in business, uh, what else you've tried. So that's probably like stuff for a different episode, but um, yeah, if you're just doing the, the work and you're putting your head down and really like focusing on doing well by people, I think that always leads to, to better and better stuff. Thank you, because I think the most important position and the takeaway here is it's not a magic thing. It's not I I just sign up for Instagram or I do these posts or I do paid promotions, whether that's through social media or through Google and Google Maps and identifying who you are and where you are. And I think there are pieces of that that can be vitally important, can be very helpful. Yeah. But what's most important is not the tricks that you're like, oh, if I do this, then I think the most important thing, and you mentioned it, is building relationships. And there's no trick to that. There's something that you would naturally do. But a lot of times when people no longer train with us, we no longer ever talk to them. We never mention them. They don't get holiday cards. They don't get a text just checking in, seeing how they're doing. It's like you stop paying me. So I stop paying attention to you. And I think I think there's a lot to be said for cultivating relationships, even past relationships, to let people know you're still there and what you do and who you are. Um, and that just as a good person, you're checking in to to see how they're doing. And if you can if you can keep that up, then that person may never come back to you, but they trust you so much that they may say, okay, uh, I have a friend looking for somebody and I do recommend this personal trainer. I just think they're a good person. They always check in on me and they're always saying what I'm up to. Um, and that I believe can go a long way. Yep, absolutely. Excellent. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to say thank you for your time and spending time with us. I want to give a, a very big shout out to my guest Taylor and for him being here today and just talking and rapping a little bit about business with me and letting you guys be here and, and, and experience what some people who are in the business, been doing the business for a while, find to be successful in on their end. And maybe you can take some, all, maybe a piece or two of what we talked about today and start implementing it for you because it can potentially help make and support your business and help it be better. And if that's the case, then I'm delighted. So with that being said, Taylor, can you just let people know where they can find you, how they can find you, information if they want to reach out to you so that uh, that they can learn a little bit more about you and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. So Superset, you can come to our website, supersetapp.com. My email is taylor at supersetapp.com. So feel free to email me directly. We are also based in New York City, like you, Rick. So uh, we're we're holding it strong in New York. Um, yeah, we have yeah. coaches come by our office all the time, by the way, and uh, we're in Chinatown, Soho area. So uh, you can quite literally find me here uh, most days of the week. And um, yeah, feel free to hit us up digitally. Our Instagram is also super set app, so just Instagram and TikTok. Um, but we primarily talk to people on Instagram, and uh, yeah, that's those are the best places to find me. Excellent. All right, Taylor, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate your time. Yeah. And ladies and gentlemen, those of you who stuck around to the very end, thank you so much. Like, subscribe, share with your fitness friends and family, and leave a five-star review if you enjoyed the podcast and then make note of it because it really does help people find the podcast and we appreciate that. So uh, y'all keep doing what you're doing, which is inspiring people to fitness. If you want to reach out to me, you can do so. Hit me up on Instagram at dr.rickritchie or email me rick.rich at nasm.org. Thanks for listening. This has been the NASM CPT Podcast.